things were over, Churchill sent for young Graham and he said, young man, I have a question. He said, what is it, Mr. Churchill? He said, do you have any hope? He said, do I have any hope? He said, yes, do you have any hope? Because I don't. D. Winston Churchill, perhaps the most dominant political figure of the 20th century in the Western world, died without hope because of what he had seen in this world. It was irreconcilable to any notions of a loving and kind God. I had a brother who was in my church when I was pastoring First Shallow Baptist Church in Buffalo, New York. He was part of the Desert Storm campaign. Faithful to church, singing the men's choir. But then after he had finished his tour of duty and come back home, he didn't come back to church. And I ran into him in Wegman's supermarket. I said, brother... How come you haven't come back to church? He said, Reverend, with all due respect, I don't believe that stuff no more. I said, what? He said, I don't believe in that stuff no more. I said, what do you mean? He said, when you have seen babies blown up, and you have seen your buddies get blown up by an improvised exploding device, and people gas with poison gas, he says, I, I, I just don't believe that there is a God anymore. Harry Emerson Fostick once said that atheism and agnosticism may be a man's opinion, but it's not his instinct. And sometimes that opinion is shaped by the bitter experiences in life that we simply cannot reconcile that God is or that God cares, because if he did, then why did the things in my life happen to me in the way that they happened to me? But I remember that scene from The Color Purple when Seely, the battered, abused housewife, with them bad kids, Harpo, <laughs> mistress kids, Abused by her own father, beaten by her own husband, and then even mistreated by her stepchildren. She's having a talk with Shug, the showgirl. And Shug says, I don't pray no more, Miss Seeley, because they keep saying that God is some white man on the end of my prayers. And the Lord knows the white man has messed up this world. And if God is a white man, then I don't want to talk to him no how. And Seeley, who wasn't educated, but she wasn't ignorant. She shot back to Shug. She says, Shug, she says, it's hard to live without God, even if you don't know what he's doing sometimes. And some people doubt him because they don't know what he's doing. But while some people doubt him, I can't live without him. Because it's hard to live without God, even if I don't know what he's doing sometimes. But then again, there's a second reason why some people doubt God, even though you cannot argue against the fact that you have been blessed by God. And that is some people cannot get past the sins and the mistakes of other people of God. And other people who came in the name of God. Name of God. What you talking about, preacher? Paul says, we are living epistles for all men to read. And some of our lives, we who come in the name of God, preachers and deacons and church people, choir members and security people and audio video people or just church go to meeting folk people are reading us and, and sometimes in our false steps and missteps and our feet of clay we misrepresent the master and long after we have straightened up and started flying right somebody can't get past what they heard us say or saw us do when we are in one of our less than Christ-like moments. Here's the story of the fact that Mahatma Gandhi, when he was a young man in South Africa, looking for God, went to visit a church, and because he was colored, he was not let in in a racial case society. Better than the blacks, who were at the bottom of the racial totem pole, but not as better off as the whites, who were at the top of the white racist supremacy. And so because he was colored, not black but not white, he couldn't get in. And at the time when he was considering Jesus, it was the misrepresentation of the master that pushed him toward the Hindu faith. And while he continued to be one of the greatest spiritual leaders of all history, how might history have been different if in his formative years the church had not misrepresented the master? Our current pope, Pope Benedict, had albatross around his neck because 30 years ago, he conspired and capitulated in the cover-up of the sexual predatoring upon the most vulnerable children, not only children, but deaf children, who couldn't even cry out when they were being violated. How do you get past that and believe in the God that is proclaimed by the Pope who helped put a shroud of deceit 
on the worst of all violations. Better that you tie a millstone around your waist and cast yourself in the sea than to violate one of these little ones. How do you embrace the gospel that is told by that crooked stick? History is the story of the fact that the early Christian orphanages were not started for indigent children. No, the earliest Christian orphanages were started to be a refuge for the illegitimate children of the priests and the nuns who could not keep their vows of celibacy. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, the one who tactified, tacked his thesis, 95 thesis on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, is on record as having said that he so failed to keep his... Uh, his, his vow of celibacy that he literally took the nuns and rolled them in in the, in the very barrels that they used to make the communion wine. He rolled them into the monastery because he could not keep his priestly vow. You know, there's an old saying, it says, to live above with the saints I love, that would be like glory. But to live below with the saints I know, now that's a different story. Because all we like sheep have gone astray. And even though we may have straightened up and fly, we're flying right now, somebody saw us with our great big cross around our neck cussing at the same time. Somebody saw us with our clergy sticker in the back of our car driving up to the liquor store. Somebody saw us when the police came to our house because there was a report of domestic violence when Deacon so-and-so and Deaconess so-and-so fell out in church. Somebody saw us and can't get past the sins and the mistakes of other church people to believe that God still is or that God still cares. That's why all of us, even though we're getting it right today, need to be a little bit humble. I like what Maya Angelou said in her poem, I Am a Christian. She said, when I say that I am a Christian, I am not shouting that I am clean living, but I am whispering that I was lost, now found, and am forgiven. She said, when I am a Christian, I do not speak of this matter with pride. I admit that I have stumbled and I need Christ to be my guide. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I profess that I am weak and I need his strength to carry on. When I say that I am a Christian, I'm not boasting of success. I admit that I have failed and I need God to clean up my mess. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not pretending to be perfect. My flaws are far too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I am a Christian, my heart still feels the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon his name. When I say I am a Christian, I am not holier than thou. I am just a simple sinner who received God's good grace somehow. But there is a third reason I think the faithful sometimes struggle with believing in the goodness of God and doubt God. And that is sometimes we have problems with surrendering to his will. Which was man's original problem in the garden when God said you can, you can have the run of the joint, you can eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge you shall not eat in the day that you do you shall die. And then Satan came along on two feet. It wasn't the last time Satan would come along on two feet. Because sometimes the devil wears Prada. Help me, somebody. And said, what did God say to you? God said, we shall not eat of the tree of knowledge from the day that we do, you shall surely die. He said, no, that's not what God said. God said that if you eat of the tree of knowledge, you shall be like him. And so he gave him the false proposition that you can eat of the tree of knowledge and through knowledge you can be like him and know good and evil, which is to know everything, which means we don't need God, which means we can get smart enough to then be able to declare independence from God. I can get smart enough to where I don't need to come to church all the time. I can go to college and get my degree, then I can just come on the first Sunday and get communion. I don't even need to come for the praise and worship and all the preliminaries, I'll just get there for the sermon. I can get smart enough, I'll just mail in my tithes. Or since I ain't really tithing, I'll just mail in my tip every now and then to keep my name on the roll. I can get smart enough, I don't have to be faithful. I don't got to go to Sunday school anymore, a Bible study, because now I know Shakespeare. We don't want to surrender 
I'm an elected official now. I own my own business now. I'm smart now. I don't got to do all this stuff that mama did. Knee bent, head bowed, throwing kisses to God. I got to be controlled and refined. It bespeaks my social standing. That's why some of y'all always call them out after church on Sunday. Tell me, ooh, Rem, I almost shouted today. Almost? Almost? Going to worship saying you almost shouted is like one spouse telling another after love making that that almost satisfied me. Almost? That's an insult. Have I got a witness? We don't want to surrender. There was a man at uh, LA Fitness where I go to the gym and he said to me Reverend I've been trying to get him to come to church he said Reverend if I come to your church I have a question do I have to stop going to the club and I got ready to answer him and he said well, wait, 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 I got another question he said Reverend if, if I go to your church do I uh, he said do, do, do I have to stop chasing women and, and I don't talk about just having one woman. He says, I like variety. So, so do I got to stop chasing women? I, I, and I got rid of answer. He said, no, 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 I got another question. He said, if I come to your church, he said, I'd like to have a glass of wine with dinner. And, 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 and so do I have to stop drinking? And, and I, I got rid of answer. And, and he said, no, no, I got another question. And then he went on. He had about 12 questions. He just went on and on and on. And finally, I said, when he got done with his list, I said, listen, when you come to the Lord, there ain't but one thing you got to give up. He said, well, what is that? I said, control. You got to give up control. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You got to give up control. You all heard the story about the little boy in the cookie jar? This little boy's mother had made some cookies for the church bakery. And she said, boy, don't eat these, these for the church. He said, okay, mama. Mama had to go run in there, and as soon as she left the house, he did what any self-respecting boy would do. He grabbed a chair and began to climb up upon the refrigerator to get the cookie. But to his dismay, Mama had forgotten something. Circled back around to the house, came in the door. When she got there, the boy was all up on the refrigerator. Had his hand shoved deep in the cookie jar, reaching for the biggest cookie down in there. And his mama said to him, boy, get your behind down from that cookie jar. He said, mama, I can't. She said, listen, just take your hand out of that cookie jar and come on down. He said, mama, I can't. She said, why can't you? He said, because my hand is stuck. And she looked at it and she said, boy, listen. She said, all you got to do is relax your hand and it'll slide right on out. He said, no, it won't, mama, I can't. She said, why can't you? He said, because I relax my hand, I got to let go of the cookie. And that's why some of us are stuck. We won't let go of the cookie. And I don't know what your cookie is, and you don't know what my cookie is, but don't miss heaven holding on to that cookie. That cookie will kill you. That cookie will rob you. That cookie will steal from you. Let go of the cookie. Everybody tap your neighbor and tell them, let go of the cookie. And hold on to God's unchanging hand. Jesus, Paul said about Jesus, he emptied himself and became of no reputation and put on the form of a servant and then told us, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You got to give up control. You got to let God sit at the center of your life, to sit on the throne of your own existence. So many of us are practic practicing practical atheism. We want to be God unto ourselves. You can't be God unto yourself. You're just a dog realizing you got a master that's been better to you than you've been to yourself you gotta bow down before him and then worship and adore him listen let me say this I'll get out your way some of you may remember February the 9th 2010 February the 9th 2010 27 days after 